welcome to the program. Thank you. You know, drawing on all your experience, and you've had lengthy experience in national security, whether as a French diplomat, as a UN diplomat, now as head of the International Crisis Group, can you explain how ISIS is still out there after more than two years of U.S. and coalition bombing? 2017 starts like 2016 ended. Well, I think whether it's IS or Al-Qaeda, because, all, by the way, Al-Qaeda is still out, very much out there, we don't have the right strategy. Uh, we think that we can do it on a global scale, while in reality the causes of IS are very local, where the very harsh uh, tactics of the government radicalized uh, some parts of the opposition. And that's why IS really flourishes on conflict. The so best way to stop IS is to, to prevent conflict. Okay, well, given that, what do you expect to happen under a Donald Trump who said that his view of, of IS is just to, you know, bomb the hell out of them? What do you think can be done differently with a new administration? I do hope that uh, he will not act on his uh, idea of bombing the hell out of IS, because that's not the way to go. The way to stop IS is to have people who feel they have representation in government and then they move away from uh, radical uh, elements. That's, that has been a proven method wherever they have been terrorists. And uh, the, the notion that you can just crush them is wrong, because then they disperse. They move to the next country, as we have just seen in, in Turkey. Now, Turkey is being infected by the uh, chaos in Syria. You see in Libya, the, uh, uh, the, the chaos in Libya now is uh, spilling over in the Sahel. Uh, so you, you push in one point, you just uh, <laughs> spread the disease in other countries. Mm -hmm. the, the, the problem, though, Mr. Guheno, is you know better than most because you've sat at the top tables while this chaos has been implemented all over the world. Nobody seems to have the patience to talk about governance and to talk about representation uh, of people so that this IS infection doesn't feed on it and grow. And in fact, President-elect Trump uh, says that, again, he's not interested in nation building, and he even believes that he may or may not like Assad, but that Assad is there to fight terrorism. And, and that's why the US should with Russia back that. So Assad is going to stay. Again, how is that going to change? Well, you see, I think there's been a big shift in the pendulum. There was a time in the early 2000s when both uh, President Bush and the UN thought you could really rebuild the world. I think now we have been chastened. We see that it's much more difficult. But the pendulum shouldn't go in the other direction and think that we can do anything about it. Now, for Assad, uh, the rhetoric of Assad must go did not fit with the reality. Assad is part of the picture, but at the same time, the notion that you can have a stable, long-term Syria with a government that ignores a big chunk of the population, that's not going to work. Mm -hmm. What I do hope is that between Turkey and Russia, they're going to have some kind of agreement because, uh, so that there is a more inclusive government gradually. Uh, if that doesn't happen, I think the Russians will be stuck in Syria, and I think they don't want that. So that may be why they can come to a deal with Turkey. You've written a major uh, piece about the challenges ahead, and you've also said we're about to enter one of the most dangerous decades that, that, that you remember, certainly in, in modern history. Why? Why is this going to be more dangerous than what we've just gone through? Well, I think, you know, there is a trend that started during the Obama administration, a kind of U.S. retreat. But Obama wanted to compensate that with a very strong support to multilateral institutions, to organizations that cr create, so to speak, the bricks and mortar of the international system. If you don't have that, if every country thinks uh, it has to look first at its own interest uh, without any consideration for the broader implications, then you can have a lot of wars and clashes, and that's a dangerous situation. Mm -hmm. The U.S. is by far uh, overwhelming in terms of power, but if the hard power of the U.S. is not made acceptable by a soft power, by a sense that there are principles that guide U.S. policy, then the rest of the world will get very nervous. Mm -hmm. And that, because again, Donald Trump has talked about a transactional foreign policy, uh, basically for America's best interest. What is that going to mean? Well, the world cannot be just a succession of deals. It needs predictability. 
And in that respect, I think one should be interested in China, because China knows full well that it's, it's, it is a growing power, but it wants it. You, you heard what they said on climate change. They think it's, this agreement is important. China does not want an unpredictable world. And to avoid an unpredictable world, you need structures. You need more than deals. You know, it's like in business. You have uh, business people who think that you go from one deal to the other, and others who think you have to build a relationship with a client. Well, the world is more the second model than the first. Mm -hmm. So if you were to look ahead, what do you consider the most serious challenge and the most difficult one to get to grips with on the world stage coming up, let's say, in the next six to, to 12 months? Well, I think the, uh, the way we're going to address the issue of the instability in Europe is major. Because if we see a deepening of the European uh, crisis, if you see the European Union uh, in danger, then one of the major voices, balancing voices in the world will be lost. And during the Obama administration, there was strong support for the European Union. Uh, I think it's the best interest of the United States to continue to support the idea of the European Union. And the European Union is going to be challenged in 2017.